All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session 17B um, for collection system stakeholders. Uh, this presentation is a update on Ben's citywide septic to sewer program. A um, couple house cleaning items. Uh, this is a recorded session. So if you have a question at the end, there's a microphone there in the middle of the room. We ask that you would use that. Um, and then also the room is big. And so uh, if you're able to move forward, that's great too. Um, appreciate the, the help there. So uh, our presenters today are Susanna Jubler. And Susanna has over 25 years of experience in project management, land use planning, and policy analysis across Oregon. Uh, prior to joining uh, Barnley and Worth, Susanna was the city of uh, was with the city of Bend, where she managed a 190 million dollar bond measure for transportation projects and the lead community involvement research uh, and development of the city's specific sewer uh, septic to sewer conversion program, among other high priority projects. And then also presenting is Alex Doza. Alex Doza is a licensed professional engineer with a bachelor's degree in environmental engineering from the University of Central Florida. She is a project engineer for the city of Bend, Oregon with 1.5 year or 4.5 years of project management experience on various capital improvement projects with a focus on sewer utilities and water reclamation. So thank you guys. Hey, hi everyone. Thanks for coming um, to our presentation so late in the day. Um, I'm Susanna Jolber and I work now for Barney and Worth. Um, when we um, kind of developed this project, as Colt explained, I work for City of Bend. I was the project manager there. So I'm just going to give some background on the program. And then Alex is the engineer at the City of Bend who actually manages the program now. And so we're going to talk, talk to you a little bit about that. Um, so thanks for, thanks for coming and staying tuned. Um, so just um, if folks don't know, we're in Bend. I don't know how many people have been to Bend or nowhere. Okay, yeah, like most people in the world probably by now. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's located in Central Oregon um, and we're on the east side of the Cascades. We don't get as much rain as um, the west side, probably a lot like Spokane and Eastern um, Washington. So if you're from there. So um, and Bend has a lot of great things to offer, um, recreation, a lot of breweries, if you're into that, um, the mountains, skiing, things like that. We also are pretty good at job growth lately. So um, we have a high quality of life. And um, because of that, um, we've been booming population wise. So um, this chart shows uh, population growth between 1970 and estimated today. So in 1970, Bend's population um, was seven and a half times smaller than it is today. Um, we're at over 100,000 now. I've lived in Bend about uh, 19 years, I guess. And when I came, I think it was, I think it was 60,000, 61,000. So it's definitely boomed. It's, it's still a fantastic place to live, but that population growth led to a lot of issues with infrastructure, providing infrastructure that was um, sustainable and um, supported the, the growth long-term. So as part of that, we have um, not only transportation failures and, and needed uh, improvements, which is um, Colt talked about the $190 million transportation bond, but our wastewater system is, is a pretty complex system. Um, we have about 480 miles of sewer mains. Um, it's got an interesting combination of 67 pumping stations. Somebody once told us that that is more than um, New Orleans has, you know, and we're at about 4,500 feet in elevation, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the city actually maintains around 300 home pumping stations, and those are legacy issues that the city kind of inherited as, um, as uh, land was annexed into the city limits. Um, so it's got four different types of collection infrastructure, and it collects about 6 and 6.2 million gallons per day. Um, so that Fast low growth left a lot of areas of town um, kind of concentrated in Southeast Bend on septic. Um, those are all in the city limits. Um, we have citywide, it's all the parcels in green there. Those are developed parcels. And then the purple is it were vacant parcels at the time we did this map. But most of the concentration of the septic systems are in Southeast Bend. Um, and that was annexed back in uh, 1998. So 
you can see the area labeled A1. There's about a thousand homes actually between A1 and A2, which is across an irrigation canal um, that were annexed in 1998. And a good portion of them, about 65%, were relying on septic systems that were installed in the 1970s. Um, the kind of unique thing about this area is that it's um, really low density. Like there's, um, you know, acre lots, half acre lots. Um, it's people that have lived there a long time um, and they've just kind of stayed on their, their original systems for um, forever. And many of them didn't think they had issues with them um, until some of them, their drain fields start failing. Um, it dissipates pretty quick, but um, it was evident in some people's yards, you know, there would be an odor, there would be some ramifications. And um, we work with the county a lot um, to kind of identify areas with, that have problem issues. And this was being identified as a kind of a problem area. Um, so we had a situation kind of brewing um, because, you know, as I said, a lot of people stay on septic until they, they realize there was a problem. It's something like, you know, you're always putting aside money um, maybe for your roof or, or, you know, some kind of repair, deck repair or something, but not many people put aside maintenance dollars for their septic system. Um, and our situation was with that the city um, to kind of transition to that, um, off of that complex uh, collection system of different pumps and things like that. Um, the collection system master plan provided uh, guidance to shift a, gra a gravity system. And so as part of that, um, there is a project called the Southeast Interceptor that was going down, down the alignment that you can see in yellow there. And what that was gonna do is put um, about 129 households. It's actually more than that because it's beyond the boundaries of, of um, this map, but 129 households within 300 feet of the Southeast Interceptor. So technically they would have um, sewer available. And so by city code, they would be required to connect to sewer within six months of notice. Um, so uh, we took a step back. Um, the public works director at the time kind of said, this is going to be insane. I mean, we're going to have leapfrog development um, with people hooking up. It's not going to be coordinated. People were upset, you know, um, as you can imagine. Um, and our goal really was to kind of look at a coordinated solution to the whole, whole issue. So um, some of the benefits of a coordinated approach as opposed to um, each individual property owner hooking up as their system fails. Um, so coordinated approaches, um, you can provide payment options for residents to allow payoff over a longer term. Um, property owners can maximize their economic value of their property. A lot of people were not able to at a bedroom, at a bathroom, at a hot tub, um, or use their deck because their system was at capacity or um, their drain field was in the way, um, taking up space on their property. And these are big lots. So, um, you know, it was a, it was a big um, economic barrier remaining on septic. Um, there's a lot greater efficiencies so we can minimize the connections to the trunk lines to that Southeast interceptor. We actually, um, it was constructed with the main line and then across uh, the top of it, and Alex, can, I'm probably going to call it the wrong thing, but um, is a mini main that people connect to. So that cut down on the individual connections to the sewer pipeline. Um, and then it promotes um, the coordinated method, promotes other um, goals of the city. You know, we have one of the more expenses, expensive median um, household price. So um, homes, the median home price is like 745, I think I just read now. It was a little lower back then, but you know, it's just crazy. If you can't um, provide these folks with um, a usable, workable system for their wastewater, they're gonna be out of their home eventually when the county you know, implements, they condemn them because they don't have a functioning wastewater system. So it makes sense for us, it made sense to kind of work out a solution, a coordinated approach and keep people in their homes if we could. Um, and just when people hook up as they fail, probably most of you are aware, you know, it's, there's no ability for shared cost. It's really just all on the homeowner. Um, the economic value of folks' homes are limited um, by those risks. And then property owners and a lot of folks in this area are older, a lot of unfixed fixed income. 
um, they have to figure out their own their own plan, their own project management for their own um, transition to hook up to a lateral, and it's just overwhelming for people. Um, so this is kind of illustrates the no action coordination option or no no city coordination option. So you can see um, the House Number One. I don't think we do have a pointer, but um, House Number One um, is at a higher grade than House Number Two. They're within 300 feet of a septic system. So, um, or sorry, of the sewer lateral. So their system fails, and they've got to put in a really expensive um, connection to that lateral. Whereas property two um, is, you know, can benefit off of that, and they pay a lot less than the first person to hook up. And so what this was really doing is kind of pitting neighbors against neighbors. Like, well, you're closer to the to the sewer, so you're going to get a better deal. I'm way back here. Oh my God, you know help <laughs> help us figure something out and um conversely what can happen too is you know property owner three or property owner two if they're within on smaller lots they're closer to the lateral they can fail and then they're putting in the system and property owner one is benefiting off of that if that makes sense um so it's a lot better to do this coordination um and this this graphic just talks about why it's so hard to convert kind of I, we talked about already um you know there's that si single septic septic system failure neighbors think their own system is just fine neighbors don't support the sewer extension cuz it's expensive to convert um the property owner requests a permit just to replace or repair a system they get that they invest in their system and the cycle just continues um so our city leadership at the time thankfully had the foresight to just sort of acknowledge that they were going to have to look at some sort of ratepayer subsidy to help people um, connect and and hook up to sewer. So what's the solution? This map actually shows all the all the lots in blue had septic tanks that were over 25 years old. So you can see most of the most of this area. It's about 550 homes um, had a lot of a lot of stuff going on there <laughs> that needed to be addressed. Um, so the city at the time, we knew we needed an engineering um, a design for sewer for, for the areas in blue and everything. Um, but we also knew that people were pretty upset about this. And so um, we were interested in doing some public involvement and then we needed a finance strategy. Um, so I won't get into the engineering details, but the system design came back at $30 million, which divided by 500 homes is about you know, 90,000 um, a household, which is just not, I mean, people just can't do that. Um, the cost to replace a system is like 35,000, 30,000, depending on the um, characteristics of your lot. So we wanted to find a way to make it a little bit more equal to what it would cost to replace your septic system to kind of incentivize people to move off of septic and onto sewer. Um, so as part of that, we formed an advisory committee. It was 12 members. There were opposition leaders as well. Probably half of the committee were people that were very suspicious of the city, the things that were promised to them that were, you know, when they were annexed and weren't supportive of this process at all. Um, and so I think that's one of the takeaways from the project to kind of bring in your opposing forces and involve them early on. Um, we did public opinion research, which showed um, kind of citywide um, support for, for maybe a small rate increase to help people um, with these costs. So there was kind of this community driver that we need to help folks. We can't have areas of town that are um, have all these failing systems and creating a, a hazard and things like that. We had super well attended meetings. I mean, like public meetings with, I don't know, 250 people and stuff over a year long period um, and council li listening sessions and things. And what came out of um, the whole process was the advisory committee, they were great. They recommended this um, kind of a few steps that the city could take. They wanted us to look at a branded proactive program to address this on a citywide level. So looking beyond their little area of the 500 homes, but something that could be replicated citywide. Um, they wanted to look at um, sort of a policy that would share the cost between the city and the homeowner, um, look at a citywide solution. So a step fee. So that's, that actually stands for, um, in their, their words, septic tank elimination program. So um, just kind of a proactive program, give people project management assistance, 
Um, as I mentioned, there are older folks there that have a lot of hard time kind of, I think anybody does, right? Um, that are, isn't in kind of this business. Um, hard time understanding their requirements, their permits, their building permits, and then also um, setting aside some funding for a safety net program for low-income folks um, and uh, folks on fixed income. And I think people can qualify for that still with 80% um, of uh, median income. So Alex will talk a little bit about that. Um, and, so, uh, and so what happened, um, we couldn't adopt exactly what they, everything they wanted. So um, we took kind of like the main points and um, developed this program funded by a small rate increase um, to help cover the costs. And we created the neighborhood extension program. Um, so two and a half million annually since I think 2018, 2019 has been set aside um, to help streets compete um, for funding to bring the sewer mains down, down people's street. And this isn't kind of like a new you know, thing we thought of. Uh, there's a lot of different locales that do a similar program. Um, so anyway, we used a lot of peer review and things like that to develop this. So pri private property owners still pay for their own private costs. So that includes um, all the plumbing and the retrofitting that um, for their own private property. So beyond the right of way on their property, they are responsible for everything. And then um, there's incentives for timely hookup. Um, Alex will talk about the fee structure and then a hundred K set aside for low income assistance. Um, so uh, the program, yeah, it's been effect, in effect since 2019. I think I spoke about it a few years ago at a WIFTEC conference and um, we only had a little bit of data because it hadn't been really running yet. So Alex is gonna talk about the program and give you updated numbers and it's pretty exciting what's happening. Thank you and thanks Susanna um, for helping to lay the groundwork um, for this program and, and everyone else out there that um, helped because it was no easy, no small feat. Um, so yeah, just, well, I'll provide an update um, of the program itself and um, kind of where we're at and the details of the program a little bit. Um, so this is in its third year of construction. Um, it started in 2019 officially with construction. Um, residents who are in an area of, um, who are just served by on-site septic systems can apply. Um, and the selection occurs on an annual basis. Um, and there's several criteria that um, I'll go through. Uh, and it is funded through um, rate payers and strategic capital improvement funds, which quickly goes over my head talking about the funding, um, but I'll leave it at that. Um, and property owners who sign the application are required to connect within two years. So that's kind of the crux of um, kind of balancing the, um, the cost share and um, being selected. It's one of the criteria to being selected. Um, and then other requirements to connect um, is a topic that I, I like to make sure that um, all the property owners are understanding because um, it's related closely to um, their decision making on whether or not um, they're interested in signing the application for the program. So um, I don't think I have you know the, the title 15 anywhere in this slide, but um, it's things like what would trigger um, somebody having to connect um, to the sewer, whether they want to split their lot. Um, Susanna mentioned these are typically large lots and um, you know, you can't, you can't subdivide, you can't add an ADU, you can't do anything where um, your septic tank um, exceeds your current capacity. So um, things like that would trigger um, a sewer connection in any event. So, so this is just um, a process flow chart of the application process. Um, it's very public facing. So, um, you know, this helps as a kind of a first step to sit down with the um, applicant and um, usually uh, myself or, or one other person at this point who are running the program. Um, and we do an in-depth meeting um, because this program is a little confusing. Um, it took me quite some time to get all the details. So, um, so it's, it's important to understand the fees, the steps, the impacts, um, you know, because at the end of the day, if you sign your name or you go to your neighbor and you try to explain to them why they should sign up and then they commit to it. Uh, excuse me, they're committing um, kind of a big financial um, ask. So 
Um, usually one person spearheads this, um, this effort and they are the ones that do the door-to-door -door, um, solicitation to, um, to try and get signatures and then they turn that into um, to the city. And then, and then we score based on um, some criteria that I'll go through annually um, after September 1st and we present staff recommendation to the, uh, the selection committee. Um, and then those three steps happen for every application. And then everything after that assumes um, an application is selected. So once an application is selected, you have um, one year for design and then the following uh, year for construction. And then when construction is complete, the city mails um, a letter called notice of operational completion um, that lets property owners know that sewer is now legally available. Um, it also lets the county know, it lets the city know, and the building department. There's a lot of coordination um, across agencies um, uh, so that the septic tank can abandon or can be abandoned, um, which is the county jurisdiction. Um, and, the, and then the city can issue plumbing permits and then the, the property owner can get to work connecting to, um, to public sewer. So um, there are six selection criteria. Um, the one I guess I'll start with is the percentage of signatures because that's the one that uh, most people can relate to. Um, it's kind of the, the first, um, the thing that they go around and they try and solicit to get signatures, um, which does impact their score, the more people that are interested, um, but, it's not the, but it's not the only thing, uh, but it does tie to the incentives. Um, so, so people, um, so people really kind of lock in on that one, but there are other ones, the cost of the project, obviously we look at, um, you know, we evaluate um, whether it may be served with pressure or gravity sewer and we um, estimate accordingly. The number of properties that would be served um, and would benefit from the project, the age and the status, whether the system is failing, um, and any proximity to city plan projects. So we try and um, take a synergistic approach where we can. So working with, um, you know, if there's any um, streets, planned streets projects or other CIP projects in the area um, to both try and uh, gain synergy and avoid conflicting construction, obviously. Um, other factors is I think purposely meant to be a catch-all, but, um, but really one example I can think of is um, you know, if there's an area that didn't really score high in the other criteria, but um, is kind of a predecessor for the alignment or drainage for other areas that would flow into um, that area, then it would score higher, um, you know, for obvious reasons. So. so just an update on where we're at with the program, I'd say we're pretty successful so far. It's still pretty new, um, but the first completed project was in 2020. We installed 144 sewer laterals. Um, that's a, quite a large number, but it was sort of combined with um, a couple of pump station decommissionings and it was, it was a little bit of a bigger project, but um, did have that um, neighborhood extension um, component. Uh, the second project installed 41 sewer laterals and um, the one we're currently working on this year is um, gonna install 48. It's partially complete, so it should be complete um, within the next several weeks. Um, We've selected the um, next project. It's currently in 90% design. Um, it'll install 34 sewer laterals and um, applications, like I said, were due annually September 1st. So we're currently um, evaluating those and um, we'll be um, presenting a recommendation in um, middle of October. Um, so you can see this is kind of on a rolling cycle. You're kind of always working three years out. You're either working on your selection this year um, doing your outreach, um, which is pretty much ongoing. Then you're working on your design, then your construction. And two years after that, you um, have two, you have two years after it's complete to hook up as a property owner. So, um, you know, it's, and then, and then that's always rolling, kind of leapfrogging every year. So it's, um, it's a pretty immersive program. Um, so, and it's pretty popular. So there's, there's 22 applications in the queue this year. Um, you know, estimate construction estimate is about twenty eight million dollars, um, and that's really without any um, any solicitation. Um, so that's just ones that were either in the queue from 
the beginning or have you know turned in their applications this year, but since um, we're not actively going out and sort of um, marketing this at this time, because there's um, quite a few in line for um, consideration. So um, since it due to popularity, city council did just recently approve an increase of one million. So it's gonna um, increase from two and a half to three and a half start, you know, available in the next fiscal year, um, fiscal year 24, which is July 1st of 23, but anyway. So just some statistics, um, the number of connections um, or the percent, I guess, of connections for the neighborhood extension program, which is the application-based um, collection-based program is 46% since um, that 2020 completion, um, which is pretty great considering none of them have expired yet um, since they have two years um, if they did sign to connect. Um, and then the Southeast Interceptor, which Susanna mentioned, um, that interceptor that kind of triggered this whole program. Um, since we did install laterals with, um, with that project, we're still tracking it, um, but we kind of built a, an app so that we can track them separately. Um, so I would say that's pretty successful so far, percentage-wise. Um, Just um, stuck in the current fees there because we always get that question and it's always the hardest thing to talk about. Um, but just, I guess, to go over it um, at a high level, um, the homeowner pays for the private costs. Um, we don't really even provide estimates, um, that's dangerous. So um, the city portion of the fees is, com is comprised of the connection fee, which is actually, um, the cost of installing the lateral from the main to the property line um, and the system development charge. Um, that, that's just, that's not unique to this program as you, as you all know. Um, so the incentive there for the, for the cost is that if you do connect within the two years, um, you get 50% off of that connection fee. So, um, you know, if you did, if you did sign, you are required. If you didn't sign, you're not required to connect within that two years, but you would, you could still benefit from that fee. So we're really incentivizing and encouraging um, people to connect, you know, regardless of, of whether they signed up or not, if sewer does come down their street. Um, and we do have, I don't think I have a slide specifically for financial aid, but since it was mentioned, we do have um, an opportunity for, um, those that qualify to have that connection fee fully waived. Um, yeah, it's 80% of the median income. So, um, so this is just a screenshot, this one, and then the next slide. Um, just like to share, you know, we're always working on, on tools that can improve our, um, the way we organize our data. Um, since this program is fairly new, we're tracking mostly on Excel spreadsheets. But um, I could see um, this quickly getting um, overwhelming to track on a spreadsheet. So you know, we're, this is in the very early stages. So um, we're still working to improve it. But our Office of Performance Management was um, kind enough to build you know, something that we felt would be helpful to us where we could integrate um, you know, our current GIS data um, showing whatever, showing whatever we find. Um, helpful, but integrate it with sort of where the applications are so we could um, evaluate kind of spatially, um, you know, so I just want to share that example. And then this is another web application, um, similar, but a little bit different. It just shows kind of a dashboard um, in how many connections we've had to date. Um, one connections that are expiring and um, you know I keep mentioning we have two years they have two years to connect so when those expire you know how do you track uh, from a code enforcement perspective uh, the ones that have expired um, so we're not quite there yet because it's so new and we actually haven't um, hit an expiration date so but we are working on you know figuring out what what tools would be beneficial for us to um, to improve our, our program management so um, That's all I have. Some lessons learned from 
Yeah, go ahead from the program itself. Okay, um, so just wrapping up um, a few lessons learned. So um, when we first started um, this, you know, I think this happens in a, probably a lot of places too. The um, city council, you know, that raising rates is not like a popular thing to to talk about to the public. So it was like we're not going to do this by raising rates. But I mean, I think we confirm with the peer cities too, there's no way to do this without raising rates a little bit. But you know, I think we factored in, it was like a 2% um, rate, rate increase. And the city at the time was doing a bunch more rate increases to the sewer um, fund and the sewer rates. And so it's all kind of like wrapped into that. I mean, it was like a minimal thing to kind of help people out and it makes a big bang for people's buck. Um, so, the solutions really require, you know, a concerted effort um, by the property owners and then uh, the wastewater utility or the ratepayers. So it's kind of a dual thing. You can't really expect people to pay um, ninety thousand dollars to get out of this, and it's kind of easy to go, well, you shouldn't have bought a house that was on septic. But um, you know, it's probably a better idea to try to work towards a solution. A lot of these folks bought their house when it, it was in the county. Um, there was a vote on annexation back in 1998, I think, when they were annexed. And um, it, it passed. It was from the residents in that area. But a lot of people, you know, don't remember that or they remember, you know, that promises were made at that time that sewer was going to be provided to them. So it was better in this case to kind of work with folks rather than just sort of go, it's it's all on you guys, good luck. Um, and then it keeps people in their homes too. That might be at risk for losing them. Um, so that kind of feeds into affordability should be considered at every step. Um, if you're gonna go about this, kind of figure out what it's gonna take for folks um, to change out a septic system or repair a drain field, change out the whole system and then make it somewhat equitable to that. So I think with our fee structure, we kind of went that route. And then also look at the demographics of the area. So this was um, a little bit lower than the median income in Bend. And so it made sense, um, you know, and older folks. So it made sense to kind of work with this area in a really wealthy area. I don't know, it's a policy issue, how you're gonna kind of disperse those costs. Um, and then work to engage the community members and elected leaders. Um, to help formulate solutions. We had two city councilors that were super involved in, in this and that really helped um, along the way. So even though it's an infrastructure project and you know a lot of jurisdictions would have kind of kept it in engineering, I think it has a wider impact. And so it's good to get your elected leaders on, on board because that's who they're, you're, they're gonna hear from, folks who are upset about this. So um, it's good to kind of engage them in the whole process. And then in urban areas, especially city limits where things are getting to be higher density and um, neighbors are transitioning, you know, I think um, neighborhoods create long-term liabilities. So it's really important just to kind of like identify this as a problem and, um, and go for a solution. I do wanna to say too, uh, another lesson, um, we worked with the Department of Environmental Quality to um, have some lenience because if you remember, and most jurisdictions are like this, if sewer is available within a 300 and you're within 300 feet, you have to hook up. But through this program, they were like, okay, people are committing to hook up with in two years and we're okay with that. We're not gonna enforce people to hook up unless they have a completely failing system and there's no other alternative. But the fee structure gives that latitude where people can hook up within two years of availability as opposed to six months or they can wait and just pay more. They, they can sit on their system. So also work with um, you know, the state agencies and the county too as a good partner in um, trying to figure out a solution. So um, I, think, I think that's it. Uh, any questions? Yeah, go ahead and uh, the mic there in the middle. Thanks, ladies. Uh, nice presentation. Appreciate your time. Um, you, I don't. I wasn't able to really gauge how old this part of town is, but I was just curious if there was any kind of coordination uh, with other utilities or road work or things like that to further um, have have some savings since it's already 
affecting the overall tax base that you have there. And then kind of another question, and I think you kind of answered it right at the end there. As you're working with DEQ, um, do you think that, you know, they're, they're looking for a certain amount of progress in this and keep, to keep it going because of that 300 foot rule? We have it here in Spokane as well. And so we, we have, we work together quite well with them, but just curious as to, as to how you think that'll go in the future, if you can anticipate it. Thank you. Well, I'll split the answer. Um, so as far as coordinating with utilities, um, I think that's kind of a case by case, just because we have certain water districts that are um, that own certain areas. So, um, you know, in those areas, it's totally up to them. We always coordinate with our, you know, franchise utilities, um, whether they want to do improvements while we're working there or not. Most don't have the funding, most don't want to meet our schedule. So. Um, we do what we can, um, but as far as coordinating with other um, city departments to improve streets um, or our own utilities, if that were the case, um, we definitely put the effort to make that coordination. Um, it's a little, I guess it gets a little tricky in that um, we were, our, I guess the precedent has been we restore to the original condition. Um, so that's not to say we bring it to standard and put sidewalks in and actually widen the road um, for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, DEQ, um, yeah, they're they're pretty happy with the progress. I think um, I work with the county. Um, supervisor for the on-site program on another project. And he's like, oh my God, it's such a great program. I mean, it seems slow to be doing, you know, like a hundred homes a year when you've got 2,600 homes um, citywide, but you know, it, 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 it's working and it's probably all that the city can really manage to do with everything else going on too. So it'd be nice to do more homes. It's gonna take a long time, but um, yeah, it's just funding and time probably. That but they're happy with the progress because something's happening there. And then, um, you know, property owners might see their neighbor being able to add on to their house or something like that and decide, okay, it's time for me to do this or something. So, yeah. Two questions. Um, the prices you were quoting up there, does that include um, decommissioning of the septic tanks, either removal or, or filling them? And the second question is, uh, have you seen... Uh, contractors with dollar signs who have been uh, taking advantage of the situation and really gouging people and, you know, had any complaints about that? Okay, so the first one, um, does it include for, um, price to decommission the septic tank? No, that cost is a private cost. It's a, it wasn't on this chart, but it is an asterisk um, that it, that's part of the private cost for the property owner. Um, and I haven't really, I mean, I try and stay out of the, um, I guess the, what happens after the CIP or the, the public project is done. Um, so it's really between the property owner and the contractor at that point for the private work. But um, quite the opposite of what I've heard from what I've heard is that um, there's actually an opportunity for group deals. So a lot of contractors um, try and um, solicit interest from more than one neighbor who, um, who are part of hooking up. We did have an online question too. Uh, they were wondering about other incentives besides just the fee waiver that might be available or that have been uh, looked at. Um, I guess at this time, the um, I mean, the main incentive is that is the fifty percent off of the connection fee for connecting within two years. Um, the waiver is a specific type of financial assistance for those that qualify, it's quite strict. Um, but at this time, yeah, I can't think of other incentives um, that the city is providing. There's um, other subjective incentives that neighbors can go back and forth on all day, but that becomes a little bit of a personal opinion, but of, you know, for, for what would incentivize a homeowner to connect to separate, or to, to sewer, so. Hi, Marie with the uh, Clark Regional Wastewater District. So we have a 
septic elimination program that we have. Um, so your application process, since people petition and sign the petition, but they're in the queue and you have 22 of them, do you make them apply every year? Are you holding those applications? I don't make them apply every year. They're reconsidered automatically every year. Um, we do some outreach um, in the summer prior to, to the selection deadline that allows um, homeowners the opportunity to either change their signature status or update their septic tank um, condition. Um, it also provides us the opportunity to refresh um, ownership information there's a lot of change in ownership. So, um, but ultimately, yes, they're reconsidered and they do not need to reapply every year. And then on your um, application for waivers, is that just for this program or is that a citywide program for anyone? It's, it's just for this program. I, I can't speak to other city programs, but the connection fee itself is sort of unique to the program because it was, it's based on city recuperation of costs for the, for the lateral install. So um, waiving that fee is sort of unique to this program, but you know, the city has likely has other um, financial assistance programs. All right, yeah, thank you. Great job. And that's all the time we have for this one. So let's uh, thank them for the presentation.